Uh, this is uh, this is quite the melting pot. Uh, I'm I'm looking out at uh, faces that I've uh, that I've seen in the in the mapping space for the last ten plus years. Uh, I'm also uh, seeing a lot of folks um, that are uh, that are local, as I start coming out almost uh, almost quarterly, and then uh, most importantly, uh, I'm looking at a lot of new faces, and that's been one of the most important parts of uh, of these events, where uh, the community actually comes together and we get to know each other uh, a lot uh, in a lot uh, deeper uh, deeper way. Uh, my God, it is, uh, it is fitting to hold uh, Save the Map US uh, here in Detroit. This is, uh, this is a magic moment uh, in, a, in a magical place. This is a city that built the machines that changed all the infrastructure in this country. Right, these machines needed more roads. These machines needed major highways connecting the country. And the, those machines would need a new level of maps. And, and here we are, this community is coming together to build an entirely new way to make maps. And we're doing this at this moment in time where this city is now embarking on an entirely new moment, making a new kind of machines that are going to require a new kind of maps. In this community, and you see this through a lot of the talks today, many of us, we're not just mapping like we used to, walking around with GPS. Even some of the stuff that we thought was just cutting edge in terms of, uh, in terms of sensors a couple years ago, the community here is starting to build, not just, uh, is starting to build machines that complement and are going to transform how we as a community make maps. And the timing of coming together for the state of the map, uh, look, my, my goals of, this, uh, of the conversation right now is, um, is to start a conversation. To start a conversation about how we as a community can come together to not just build better, better maps for today, to build better maps for humans, but how we can build machines that help us build better maps, not just for humans, but for the new level of automation that's coming out, especially being led by some of the by some of the folks, uh, by some of the organizations here in uh, in this city. So, let me give you a little bit of framing. I, my interest is to share a little bit of background in regards to some of the changes that uh, that we are seeing, uh, and uh, then really open this up to uh, to to discussion. Uh, first, uh, for everybody that I have not uh, had a chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Eric. I work at uh, I work at Mapbox. Uh, we make it easy to put maps inside of uh, of applications. The key part there um, is we uh, we actually get paid when people use us, right? And we get paid per monthly active user. The really key part, and why this is so valuable for this community, is we get data back, anonymous aggregated data back from more than 400 million monthly active users. Uh, before working at uh, uh, Mapbox, many, many of you uh, in this room uh, know me from uh, in, on the international development side in, in DC. Uh, I came, uh, like, like you all, came to uh, OpenStreetMap because I, uh, I, I needed a better map. Uh, at the time, I was, uh, I was working in, uh, uh, in parts of Africa and parts of Southeast Asia, uh, doing election monitoring work and whatnot. And you know, there, were, there were just places in the world where there was just no context. Except on OpenStreetMap, you start seeing a little activity. And here you go, we could start working a little on the map, and next thing you know, other people would start editing together. And you could literally be on the other side of the world and start having this connection where you could go in and take satellite imagery and trace roads for an area you've never been to. And you could wake up the next day and actually people would go in and name them. That was, that was transformative. The only thing that, that, uh, that has gotten better than that first-time first community feel is actually starting to use these maps day in, day out, right? To be able to open up Snapchat and see not just gorgeous, playful maps, but wait, hold on a second. These, these, these are names. All these labels here, this community, the folks in this room help make this map. 
Uh, probably biggest launch for us uh, this year was Facebook on, uh, on Facebook's local uh, side. That means every time you're looking to go out, you can actually use not just data that's showing your kind of social graph of what your friends are interested in to help you find a better place, but you're using the data that this community created. And this is why this is so important, because the more the, the maps that we are making through OpenStreetMap get out to the larger world, we start using them in context. And now we're put in a better position to understand where our maps are strong, where our maps are weak, and it's going to grow this community. So what I love, this is the reason why I said the most important uh, part of the melting pot are the new faces. Our goal has to be to bring more and more new faces in, and we're going to bring more and more new people together because of the intrigue and because of the ownership that we can instill on people by opening up uh, that map. Uh, so what started off for us in, 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 re in regards to having a large sensor penetration through phones is, uh, is obviously getting, uh, getting more interesting. Uh, I think people saw, uh, uh, what was it, 48 hours ago, not even, uh, the launch with um, Masa, uh, SoftBank, and uh, Toyota uh, paired up and in, ter in terms of creating a JV for autonomous driving. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of our maps were, uh, were front and center of that. And you can bet uh, every single year as we've continued to invest in our own infrastructure uh, and invest in a bunch of proprietary sets of data, we have accelerated our investment in uh, various open data communities and especially OpenStreetMap. And I really wanna, I wanna make sure that that is a conversation thread happening. I was, Mikkel and I were looking at the, at the sponsor uh, sign and there you are. I mean, you're 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 seeing you're seeing Lyft, you're seeing Uber, uh, you're seeing major companies like uh, like Microsoft, um, all up there, and you're just like, what? Could you just imagine this? Just a, just a couple years ago, and to be able to have some of the corporate folks start coming in here, uh, already seeing GM on stage, as a, um, a lot of other folks from Facebook speaking, like people that are contributing back in meaningful ways. Um, this is, this is something I, I, didn't really, um, I didn't really imagine. So we have change coming, and we're seeing that change um, move. Uh, before I go on, uh, can I have a volunteer? Excellent. Quick, before you get up, uh, let, me, let, me, let me turn this on. Uh, have, you, uh, have you contributed to OpenStreetMap? Excellent. Have you ever mapped in the rain? Has anybody, how many people here have Got done OSM mapping in the in the rain. There we go. Excellent, excellent. Does anybody that mapped in the rain want to volunteer? I'm from Vancouver, sure. Paul, come on, come come uh, come on up. Excellent. Walk a little closer. So uh, we couldn't all fit in a car. So I'm actually simulating what it's like to drive. And uh, what Paul's doing right now is um, he's mapping. There are neural nets running directly on that phone, totally not part of the internet, using what it sees to detect data, in this case, specifically science. It's able to capture that information and stream that information somewhere. The somewhere question is how do we as a community leverage this? All right, uh, let me actually now show the whole crowd what you see. Thank you very much. Um, and by the way, this is in the rain. Um, all right, and Paul is not wet. Uh, so here, here's, what, here's, what's starting, here's what's starting to happen. You're, like the amount of like just, uh, buzzy words that you start hearing out there in terms of in terms of deep learning, neural net stuff running on the edge. Let me be incredibly clear what uh, the the moment in time we're in. We are able to do semantic detection, segmentation, and classification directly on the chipset. That means you can be counting these cars, you can be identifying these signs, you can be classifying the parts of the road all locally which means behind these pictures is almost like a terminal of data screaming down of what it's seeing. This is, 
this is about to be the new new. We're about to have a level of data accessible to us uh, as, as humans, and, and that's especially interesting to the community uh, in this room. Because this is, this is literally how we're starting to make maps now. As the car drives, whether it's an iPhone, whether it's an Android, whether it's a, a low-cost uh, Android OS dash cam environment, you're able to run on like Snapdragon 650, 850s. Like these are, these are, these are low-cost chips. And you're able to be doing that kind of detection and then passing that detection up, not in heavy imagery and, uh, and video, but you can actually start identifying the raw data. And through that raw data, you can say, actually, no, I need a video file. I need to pass that up. No, I've seen an abnormality. I need to take that picture and pass it up. But the point being, we now have context like we've never had before, and we're about to have that context everywhere. So to give you a sense of the big change for us, we, you know, back to those 400 million users, we're, we're collecting about a quarter billion miles of uh, data a day. That's the latitude, longitude, time stamp, elevation, directionality. And stitched all together, that allows us to make, a, make an accurate road network, um, traffic patterns, and, and whatnot. But it's just one point. Right? All of these maps that we've been making are just from GPS. What happens when you start adding additional metadata? Additional metadata that almost weighs nothing, 72 bytes here, where you start adding a precise latitude, longitude of where you've identified a sign and been able to classify that sign and give it a confidence score. What are we as a community going to start doing as this like, ramp of sensors Starts, uh, starts increasing. This is an amazing opportunity. And it's an amazing question of where OpenStreetMap fits in, where do other open data communities fit in, what of this data needs to be just a kind of live set of data to make, uh, to make a navigable road, versus what of this data can uh, uh, benefit from more context. And the most, you know, what many people say is, yeah, you know, uh, people's first impression when you come to OpenStreetMap is, okay, wait, what, what category? Uh, how am I going to do this right? My God, this, this is going to get a little messy. That, that messiness that we have in, in taxonomy, it's, it's not messy. It's, it's a shared perspective. It is, it is a collective coming together to help frame what we see. It's our taxonomy to describe what's around us. That is incredibly powerful. The question is, how can we start using machines at a level to amplify where we add context? Over the years, there's been a lot of conversations on threads where folks are saying, well, hold on a second. We, we should not be running the, this bot to go make changes. By charter within OSM, this was, this was about people on the ground, ground truth data, us coming together, curating a set of data. There was not a notion of machines. There was not a, a notion of the amount of robots that are about to come. And now we have this amazing opportunity to figure out how do, how do we use these machines to help us do better work? Because the perspective that this community has in regards to curating data and framing the space around them is incredibly powerful. So in terms of where OpenStreetMap and that perspective fits in, uh, look, for, for us at Mapbox, uh, in terms of having a navigable road network, um, we're using live telemetry data. We don't have an app. We have all these SDKs that fit in there, and we're taking this data back and from that able to make a, a specific road network and, and route against that. That's going to continue to be a very valuable asset, even as the notion of the word map changes. So you hear a lot about HD map, yada, yada. What the hell does that mean? So here, I want to pull back for a second and not just talk about how machines are going to help us make the maps that we've needed today, but how the word map and the context of map is about to change, right? So the way I look at maps for machines, or better said, maps for, for uh, autonomous driving, are four parts. Number one, no matter how good those sensors are in the car, it's going to see what's next to it. It's going to see what's down the road in front of it. It's going to know what lane it's in. The car is going to have no idea where it's going or what its sense of place is without a road network, without the map. 
And the, this community has given context to the world like none other, and that's going to be invaluable context to help any uh, robot or um, autonomous vehicle know where it's gone. Now, up until this point, the maps we've been making, we've been the interface, right? When we look at the map and we look up around, okay, we kind of like understand where we are. When we start being removed from that equation, it starts becoming a little more literal. You start needing to have a higher degree of definition, more accuracy, more precision, more timely updates. You start needing to have uh, what we're describing as HD vector maps, uh, a sense of a data transport that's all open that, uh, that can embed uh, a much more uh, refined map. It, three, this stuff has to be fast. And it has to be fast running locally offline in some of these cars to be able to hit the performance threshold for the autonomous vehicles to be making decisions. So there's a major, uh, there's a major software component that's needed not just on the server side to uh, stream down edits, but also on the, uh, on the vehicle or robot side. So if you do have a great road network, make it more high definition and make it updating fast in the cloud all the way down to the car and unpacking you've got an HG map. Now the reason I have point number four here is it doesn't matter how accurate and high definition your map is if you don't know exactly where you are on that map. And that's where the level of localization comes in. And this is going to be profound because all of these robots, all of these cars are going to need sensors, whether it's LiDAR, whether it's uh, radar, whether it's front facing cameras, this is coming. So what Paul just held up there by holding, holding the phone, we're about to have those in everything that moves. What does that mean? It's not just going to localize the vehicle. It's going to be passively gaining context of what's around. We're not, we're not going to have any more bandwidth constraints in regards to passing that data up because the actual data transform can be much smarter and much lighter. And what if you could put this in a set of apps and not worry about the traditional hardware constraints? of cost of go-to-market, but what if you could put this out of software so everybody in here building their own apps can put those neural nets in and use that data, use that context to change the experience of their app and then choose where to send some of that data. And I think that's the question that, that, we, need to be, uh, that we need to be having. And it's a very similar question to um, uh, what Lucas uh, just, uh, just ended on. We have these opportunities together to not just continue to contribute to OpenStreetMap, but to start contributing entirely new sets of metadata, whether it's things that we're flagging in terms of vandalism or, th or things that we're flagging from sensors that are going to point us where to look. Um, and we're seeing some very promising wins of how helpful these machines can be. Microsoft demonstrated the ability to extract buildings at a level and open that, uh, that data out, um, unlike any other. Uh, Facebook uh, has helped work on roads. Uh, Development C did a phenomenal job uh, using deep learning to study power grids across, uh, across Pakistan and was able to map the entire national power grid. We're at this moment here where we can make machines to go do things that we otherwise, as humanity, have not been able to do yet. And that's incredibly powerful. And the perspective to build those machines, to do that deep learning, to build those neural nets, it's right here in this room. And I think we as a community need to start having a conversation about what are we going to do with all of this insanely rich data? And where does the original charter with OSM fit where we as humans that have that special perspective of what's important to us, that appreciate the complexity of taxonomy, fit into this process. So I hope we can start talking about that now with some, uh, some questions, and um, I look forward to having drinks with everybody tonight. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Are we at time? Five minutes for questions. I'm right on time. Hey.
so uh, this is a good question. What, what, is, what is the struggle? I, I look back to, Mikkel, you were at Yahoo when, when a, no? So when, when did Yahoo open up uh, the, 30, uh, the 30 meter satellite imagery for OSM tracing? 2007. You remember that moment when we had an entirely new set of data to extract context from? That was at 30 meter. I mean, you remember how grainy that stuff was? You didn't feel it at the time because it felt special. But then bit by bit by bit, and then just look at the last, what, two years? Kevin, when, when did Digital Globe help change the specs with the US government? It was 50 centimeter down to 40 centimeter down to 30 centimeter? It was in the last two and a half years, right? Three years ago. Okay, so in the last three years, we've had an order of magnitude resolution change. And simultaneously to that resolution uh, change in regards to uh, uh, legal details, we've been able to put up a level of hardware. I mean, again, Digital Globe launched uh, the two most high power, uh, high definition satellites ever. What do we, we can see, we, with, with 30 centimeter imagery, you can read the paint on the road. What are we as a community going to do with that? Now, I mean, in regards to what Paul was holding up, I mean, he's identifying uh, speed limit signs and other signs Nobody in this room is going to have an advantage by having two extra 25 mile an hour speed limit signs in their application. And this is where the beautiful part of open can come in. Right? What of this data that we're all going to be collecting through these sensors do we start opening up to reduce total cost of ownership, make a more complete map, and allow our team resources to better focus on uh, differential needs? And I think, that, I, think that's, I think that's the question. And we, when we've come to this moment in the past, we've always been like, this is an amazing, huge opportunity. My point now is the, the definition of huge is about to change because our concept of volume cannot possibly comprehend what I think we're about to see coming from, uh, from these sensors. Uh, I don't even think uh, we have the systems to be able to process this and thread this. I mean, just, just look at some of the... Uh, improvements that have happened with HOT over the last couple years, where not only is there now a tasking uh, interface, there's now machine learning happening, classifying the kinds of tasks to assign to different skill levels. That's incredibly powerful, but that has now taken, what, two and a half years since, we, since the launch of the tasking interface with the extra? So it's just like, my point is, the w technology and the need for the kind of maps that we're thinking about is accelerating. We need to accelerate our conversations as a community to get ahead of this and to take advantage of this because this is a magical opportunity in front of us. Question in the back. Yeah, so the question is, how, how far behind is the government uh, in, its, uh, in its ability to, to regulate this? Um, look, if, it's, uh, if, if uh, watching the uh, Congress uh, interview Zuckerberg was any indication, um, I, I'm not, <laughs> I don't even want to try to put, put a gauge on that. And I feel it's never going to be able to catch up at the current, at the current rate. Um, which means it is especially important for the folks in this room to be thinking about privacy first and foremost. You know, I mean, right now, what, what kind of rules does the government have in regards to information? You know, personal identifiable information, PII, things like social security number, credit card. All right. You hear about these data breaches when that happens? When we're talking about location data, we're talking about where you were last night. And that's not PII. But it's much more terrifying. And all of us building apps have a responsibility to think about where that data goes. So, I mean, from Mapbox's sense, it's, it's easy, right? We don't do any, we're not in the advertising business, so we don't even need an ID. And we also do the, a level of anonymization and aggregation where we trim endpoints and whatnot because there's so much data. But all of us building different applications uh, need a level of best practices so you build in the security from the get-go. Other question? Or is that? Yeah. 
The, the question is in regards to Microsoft buildings. Of the 125 million buildings, how many of those have uh, been brought into OpenStreetMap? I do not know. And that, and that the, the question is how, if the, this is, if you think Microsoft buildings are a lot of, uh, a lot of data, what, we're about, what we just looked at is about to be a lot more data. How as a community can we come together uh, to leverage that? That is the question. That's what we got to talk about. But we have a history of talking about that, right? We realized that we could extend, that we could create a higher impact by making an easier editing interface to work with satellite imagery. We worked with certain satellite uh, and aerial companies to contribute open data that could then go into that better editor. And then we, uh, in times of disasters, we opened the doors to a much larger community, not, not folks day in, day out making maps, but a much larger community that wanted to help and we were able to do that uh, organization via tasking interface. We have come together as a community time and time again to figure out how to address this opportunity at hand. And we got, so the, your question is, 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 is the question I'm trying to pose to everybody. These are some of the interesting conversations we should start having. They don't necessarily all need to happen in OpenStreetMap, but they need to happen with this open collective. And this community is, has some of the best perspective in the world in regards to, uh, to geographical data like that. Um, am I out of time? Or can I take one more? Paul. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, qu the question is, when, uh, with various regulations like GDPR, um, what, what have the effects been in regards to data collection, uh, specifically referencing uh, Apple Mapbox? I can't speak, uh, can't speak for Apple uh, on this. Uh, in terms of Mapbox, GDPR had no impact. It has no impact because we were not collecting any of the personal uh, identifiable data. Uh, via mapbox.com, we had to do some things with email addresses um, in terms of outbound uh, sending email blasts, but that was it. Um, it has had an amazing impact in regards to background apps that were doing ad targeting, and it's really made that more complex. Um, I do see, look, I, I think it's going to be less, I, I really think it's going to be less about government regulation and more about certain companies that are choosing to take, take the high road. And I think Apple's done a phenomenal job saying, wait, we, we believe in, in privacy by, by default. And I think if everybody in this room, as you're building apps, uh, can look to some of that leadership and say, you know what? We're not even going to collect stuff that uh, could be de-anonymized. And you know what? We're going to actually build our neural nets to do some of the scrubbing of certain features um, uh, earlier, so we're not even able to collect that in an image that we pass up. And these, these are the conversations that I think collectively we can learn from each other, other on. Some, uh, some companies that get a little farther ahead in thinking about this are doing a really good job of contributing back. Uh, we're seeing a lot more algorithms on that contributed back to archive.org, um, especially on the deep learning side. So, good. Okay, I'll bite the bullet, and at the risk of asking a supremely unpopular question, uh, is it time we start thinking about an open machine map that sort of sits alongside open street map, i.e. one in which everyone can contribute their machine learning results into a sort of a sandbox that sits next to OSM that either imports things from OSM into open machine map or goes the other way? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, that get, might get around some of these conflation issues. So I, don't shoot me. So in terms of uh, potentially an open machine map, I don't think that's unpopular at all. If you, again, uh, looking back to the strength of, of diversity within open street map, open street map well, Fisher's art, Eric Fisher's article from five years ago showed that OpenStreetMap was the largest repository of GPS data in humanity. 
That con the thing is we're not doing anything with it. Not at scale that we can. So I think the question is, yeah, we, we can, it's very easy to set up an open, uh, yet another open data community piece. It's much harder to figure out why you're doing it and what some of the players uh, can come together. Uh, recent success, uh, I would say, points to uh, open addresses. It's been phenomenal to, to watch folks from various companies come together and say, you know what? OpenStreetMap has major advantages in how you add data. And adding addresses is not actually one of them. And we've got to go right to the government source. How can we get governments to start opening up data of those municipalities? That ends up being a phenomenal repository. So I think, I think what we're going to see is ecosystems that are open and standards that are open to allow those ecosystems to, to connect. Whether there needs to be an ecosystem more for uh, machine data or not, I think it's going to come down to, um, I think it's going to come down to what, what, you're, what you're trying to make from it. And maybe the data is even less valuable than the actual algorithms that come out of it. But I, these are, we're about to see an entire change in conversation in the agenda for conferences like this as we have, as we have questions like that. All right, I should stop now. Um, hey, thank you uh, very much. Look forward to having a drink with everybody later.